You're welcome back. Uh, time now for Connect Africa. We're taking you to East Africa in Rwanda to be precise because uh, President Paul Kagame says he's uh, hoping to be retained as president after 22 years in office. He's been speaking to his counterpart, Kenyan President William Ruto, where he indicates that a secession plan is being uh, drawn for the East African country. Head of our political desk, uh, Evans Mensa, uh, was there and joins us via Zoom now. Uh, Evans, uh, Let's start off from this uh, statement that is being made by Paul Kagame. In, in what context is he making the statement? It's very important to understand the context because you, you, this, this is President Paul Kagame who's been in office for 22 years and today standing side by side with William Ruto. Then back up a question that he is looking forward to retiring as, as president of Rwanda. That, that for me was, was a surprise, even for the gentleman from Tanzania, a neighboring country that asked the question about secession plan. Is there a secession plan uh, to, to replace him? Um, it, 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 was a, it was a big surprise uh, to hear Okagami make that point. And so that was a context of this. And there were many people who in the last few days been raising the question, this is a war run uh, country, clearly doing well economically. Everything else soon to be orderly. People are honestly doing their best to, to stay orderly and also to contribute their quota to the development of the country. But what happens after the strong leader, the strong man, the context of the question? And his answer was fascinating. He went straight for it, um, making the point that, listen, this is something that has come up before and it, it is inevitable that he will leave but it is also about growing people to succeed him and that he doesn't want to appoint the person who comes after him and that actually he's been having a conversation about who replaces him with his party watch on, on the transition part for uh, the person in the president of rwanda uh, is uh, again another issue. I, I, I fully understand what you are talking about. Uh, it's an issue that has to be addressed uh, sooner or later. I have had the opportunity to discuss it with my members of the party uh, that it is an inevitability uh, that we have to find First of all, grow leaders, and not for me to, to, to decide who is going to be the next leader after me. I think that also uh, is not necessarily uh, co correct. But to create uh, an environment, circumstances, uh, that will give rise uh, to people who can lead, uh, uh, respective of whether I like them or not. Because I think you brought it up referring to democracy. You are talking about governance. You are talking about good governance. In good governance, I don't think you want everyone exiting to be the one to decide who comes after them. So, Let's put that aside. Uh, but the situation is being looked at. Well, Evans, let's get some clarity on that. Is he looking forward to leaving office very soon? He says he is. In fact, he says, guess what, uh, Blazette, you'll be happy to hear this. He says he's looking forward to retiring and leaving office and handing over to a, a, a worthy successor and possibly become a journalist. When, when he retires and, and joins the Inky fraternity Interesting. And, and just look back on his own career as a president of Rwanda. That in fact, for since 2010, we had this discussion within our party, within our country. But the circumstances also in Rwanda and the history and the challenges tend to dictate certain things that are not may not be very common 
uh, with other situations. It's not the first time it has come up. Maybe it's not even going to be the last time. Uh, but life has to go on. <laughs> so we have, uh, we have to live our lives and, and deal with these challenges. So I'm sure one day uh, I may join the journalism. <laughs> uh, in my old age <laughs> so and then we can talk about that past that involved me I, I'm looking and here's uh, Paul Kagame speaking side by side uh, one of the leaders of uh, East Africa's biggest economy Kenya so let's talk about William Ruto as well uh, what's been his reaction his reaction was was quite different and from Paul Kagame, um, and the difference there was striking because you hear Paul Kagame talk about, he, he is willing to, to step aside and let somebody else uh, take over. He says, we've been talking about it for, for tw since 2010. And so this is something that has actively been discussed himself and his party to get somebody to, to replace him. He's, he's willing to go even become a journalist and just retire in peace. And, and, and then you hear, William Ruto, who comes from a, a, a very democratic country in, in many people's books in comparison uh, with, with Rwanda. And his answer was, I want to quote him. I want to tell you that from our own experience in Kenya, trying to get a successor can be a very dangerous project because it may not be the person that people want. And I think that is an area that requires much more than identifying somebody and saying or, or telling the the population, uh, this is the passing. So for him, from the start, he doesn't think that it's such a good idea. He doesn't think that it's as simple as saying, I want to go. Because he says, trying to find a successor is a dangerous uh, project from the Kenyan example. I'm not quite sure which Kenyan example he was referring to, but he wasn't as open to the concept of starting a succession plan as Okagami was. In fact, he went ahead to, to suggest that President Kagami has done a lot and is very commendable and that he's provided sufficient mentorship to other people and that what he's done for Rwanda, um, he, he almost deserves the right to appoint his, his successor. But And, and then you, you hear Kagami himself say, I, I don't want that because you want the process of appointing a successor to be democratic. You heard him talk about that. And so that was um, William uh, Ruto's reaction uh, to it, which, which I thought, I, I wonder what the Kenyans who, um, and there was, there was a Kenyan journalist uh, there, how they'll react to, to that, because he has his own problems back home. And he's been speaking about that too. You know, the opposition has been protesting against him uh, because they believe the elections that saw him come to power last year. And again, I was in Kenya, in the lead after that, providing some help to the uh, Kenyan press about coverage, now he's he's uh, he's facing a, a bit of a turmoil back home in Kenya, and then you hear him talk about talking about succession, somebody to to succeed a, a president, an African president. It's a disastrous project because of the Kenyan uh, example. I wonder how people receive that back home in Kenya. Uh, and how about the general public as well? How are they receiving this news? Well, this literally happened um, just about an hour ago. So I believe, you know, news outlets are beginning to now file stories. I, so reaction has been impossible to gauge because this literally, just, I just rushed in uh, to file this. Getting the files for you so people can hear him uh, talk about this was, was more important. And I'm pretty sure going forward as, as the news begin to filter, this is something I believe international media outlets will pick up, pick, pick up on because the West is fixated with, with him, with, with the longevity he's had in the president and each time questions arise about when i go to leave office comes about it excites the west i'm pretty sure this will come up come to them as uh, as news ready then we'll get to possibly hear how the rwandan uh, population and public will receive this uh, and, and by the way just a point just just a point to to make a point here if you listen to him i've been part of the party's congress and international conference he makes the point that at the congress the, after he was appointed, he actually um, raised the, the question about secession himself. He said it, that without anybody asking the question, 
after he was re-elected as a chairman of the RPF, this is just on Sunday, Ibe, for another four-year term, in his acceptance speech, he raised it himself in that speech. And I thought, he said that at, at this press conference, that he himself has been engaging this particular concept. I, I have put it to my party people. So the party supporters and the base of the party would have at least on Sunday evening had him address them on finding a successor for him. And I remember doing a story for my joint online yesterday and including that quote in which he said, for a, a, to paraphrase, that each time you give me another term, you are adding more responsibility. You are making the task even more difficult. And, and today when he said I, I talked about it, then I got the context he was referring to. In, that, in essence, it's time to, to really look for somebody to succeed me, which is what he's been talking about. Yeah, but he's been retained now as the party's leader. So how is he receiving that as well? Of course, um, he, he stood, obviously. So if he stood, then of course he, he believed he, he deserved another five-year term. Um, but just the point that he made just after, after he, was, he was sworn in, which is the point that I was stressing earlier, which comes back to how the people here have received this whole news, is you, you get a sense from him that this is something that, yes, I've, I've, I've received another five-year term, but it's, just, it, it's time, you heard him say, it, it, is, it, it is inevitable now that in the next five years, we need to have a good conversation about replacing me letting me step aside and getting somebody else in the process. I, I almost get a sense that he possibly put himself up again because he possibly feels that they haven't, that he hasn't found yet somebody who could replace him. And if you remember what he said at the beginning in his uh, opening remarks when he was asked the question, his first reaction was that we need to find leaders. We need to find people who can, who can replace me. Uh, uh, pardon me, just uh, a bit of a a bit of an interference from here. Uh, we need to find people who can replace it. And for him, that was that was an important point that he was stressing there. So I, I, I'm almost of the view, just listening to him and reading in between the lines, that he possibly believes that the succession plan hasn't been finalized, as in finding leaders. He says, quoting, first of all, we need to grow leaders. Not for me to decide, but who is the next leader, but we need to create the environment. So that's his role. His role is to create the environment and the circumstances that will give rise to people who can lead irrespective of, 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 of who he likes. And I get a sense that he wants to be suggesting there that for the, for the time being, that person hasn't emerged yet. And we're looking at all of this in the context of Africa. Paul Kagame himself is concerned about the... Uh, African solutions to African problems. So he's been concerned about that as well. How, how do we situate all of, all of that into this conversation? And today, again, beside Ruto, he makes the point um, about the African project. And so he's, he's really thinking way beyond Rwanda, the African, uh, uh, the African project. And each question he was asked about the challenges that East, the East African community is facing um, and and there, there's a lot of conflict in the DRC, for example, that they are trying to deal with. Uh, and he was he was emphatic that the solution to that particular problem has to be African first. He was not talking about Rwanda or, or, or Kenya, but has to be African first. And it makes the point that the rest of the world should not impose their solution. That what they should be doing is supporting the African solutions to African problems. And so for him. It is, it, is, it is linking whatever success that the Rwanda is having to the, to, to, to the entire continent. And, and that's on the, it's that, it's against that backdrop that we saw Ruto here. And, and Ruto himself makes the point that in the last five months since his election, he's found in Rwanda a, 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 a strong partner. And he makes, a, he makes a point when he stood with Kagame that I, I thought was fascinating. Now, this is Kenya, a very advanced democracy, uh, very wealthy, et cetera. Has had, had, well, it's had its own challenges with post-election violence, but largely uh, it's, a, it's a superpower in Africa. And yet, Ruto disclosed today that since he took power, 
he had to call Paul Kagame for Paul Kagame to give to Kenya the electronic platforms that manages the VAT, the value of the tax system. In, in other words, uh, the, the Kenyan president was appealing to Paul Kagame, the Rwandan president, to, to, to give to Kenya your, 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 your platform for managing VAT. And he says the Kagame agreed. And as we speak, he says, Kenya has been using the Rwandan platform to manage VAT and we are seeing results as a result of that. And I found that fascinating. For a country of 30 million people, that's, that's, that's Rwanda's population, very small, to be, to be the go-to country for a huge superpower like Kenya when it comes to managing taxes. It's quite fascinating to see. Mm. Anyway, uh, we'll have to leave it uh, here for now. Thanks for joining us. And that's uh, Evan Smith at the head of our political desk here at Joy News. And that's all we have for you in this package of The Pulse. I'm Lester Sudan. Log on to myjoyonline.com for updates. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.